Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. Welcome back to Talking Tudors, episode 147. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger, and I'm thrilled that you could join me today. As always, I'd like to start by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron, and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and tune into every episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com or click on the Be A Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. February's prize is a copy of the Palgrave Handbook of Shakespeare's Queens, edited by Dr Valerie Schutte and Kavita Muden Finn. A huge thank you to Dr Schutte for sponsoring this wonderful prize. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. This weekend, I'll be chatting to Kate McCaffrey about Anne Boleyn's Books of Hours. Please get in touch with me if you'd like to register for this event. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I'd love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag I love Talking Tudors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about perceptions of queenship in the 16th century is Johanna Strong. Johanna is a final year PhD candidate at the University of Winchester under the supervision of Dr. Ellie Woodacre and Dr. Simon Sandal. Tentatively titled The Making of a Queen, The Effect of Religion, national identity and gender on Mary I's legacy in the English historical narrative. Johanna's PhD thesis will examine the way in which Mary I's legacy was posthumously created and how this legacy is perpetuated into the Hanoverian period. She completed her MA at Queen's University in Canada, her home country, under the supervision of Dr. Geoffrey Collins. Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. <laughs> Welcome to Talking Tutors, Johanna. How are you? I'm great, thanks. I'm excited to be here again. 
yes, it's wonderful to have you back on the show. We chatted a little while ago, so I suppose it'd be great if you could just introduce yourself to our listeners and just tell us a little bit about your background. Absolutely. So I am just finishing up, scarily enough, my PhD at the University of Winchester. I am looking at Mary I and how she's remembered from her death in 1558 to maybe the 1660s, maybe 1688. We're still figuring out kind of word count, how far I can go. Um, so that's been my focus for the last few years. And then before that, I did my master's at Queen's University in Canada and was working on John Knox and Henry Howard's understandings of queenship, which is what we're chatting about today. Yes, we definitely are. So in your MA thesis, which was entitled John Knox and Henry Howard, an understanding of early modern Queen's Regnant, you focused on John Knox's first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women. That's a mouthful, 1558. It is. <laughs> and Henry Howard's a dutiful defense of the lawful regiment of women, 1590, and examined how both these authors actually approached female rule in early modern Western Europe. So what sparked your interest in this particular area of study? So I knew I wanted to do my master's on something queenship related. And I had been hoping to do something on Mary the first, but then as soon as I started the research, as it always happens, the research went a different way. And so as I started reading more about Knox's work, I realized there were so many different responses to it. And so the focus developed into looking at Knox and the responses. And then completely by accident, came across Howard's work and realized that very few people had actually talked about him in this context. And almost no one had talked about this manuscript in this context. And so I thought, no, this is perfect. This is the original research that needs to happen. And so fell into it in a sense by accident and then never looked back. Yes, I do. I feel like people listening have probably heard about John Knox's work. But yes, the Henry Howard's is, is less, we hear less about it, don't we? So before we dive in and look at those, you know, in detail, those manuscripts, can you tell us some of the beliefs that existed at the time about women in general, and also about women in positions of power? So women at the time, and I will preface this by saying at the time, because hopefully in most parts of the world, this has changed. Women were seen as naturally subordinate to men because life was lived by gender roles. So women were expected to stay home. They were expected to care for their families while men were meant to go out, make money, provide for the family. So very traditional roles. So women in positions of power was just unheard of in a gendered sense. It happened, but it was seen as being out of the ordinary. So Knox argues that part of this subordination is because women were created from men. So in the biblical story of Adam and Eve, Eve is created from Adam's rib in one version of, of the story. There's this belief that women couldn't possibly be anything but subordinate to men because they were literally created from men. And then there's this other side that Howard's part of that says that, yes, women were created from men, but they were created from men in order to be, as they termed it, their glory. So this idea that since Adam had been made from mud and clay and was kind of a, a dirtier beginning, Eve was made from this cleanliness of Adam's rib. And so women were pure and that had to be maintained at all costs. In that sense, women were still subordinate to men, but they could kind of talk back in a way that they, they weren't uncritically subject to their husbands or their fathers or their brothers. We have these dueling ideas of what it means to be a woman, but both of them ultimately have women as this kind of inferior sex. And that's even argued by some of the great Renaissance thinkers of the time. So we have Juan Luis Vives, who writes, commissioned by Catherine of Aragon, writes this book on education for Mary. And in it, you know, he's talking to a woman who is the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, who is a powerful woman, who herself is the daughter of a queen regnant. So is the daughter of this woman in a great position of power. And Vives still writes that women are subject to their husbands. And so this is something that really builds through this period is that women are meant 
to be at home. They're meant to be having babies. They're meant to be listening to their father until they get married and then they listen to their husband. And so this is kind of a very constricted role for women. And I think the one of the big thinkers who does talk about women in positions of power kind of before Knox and Howard is Thomas More. And he had written about female rule in the abstract. So he's obviously living in Henry VIII's lifetime when there's a king. And so he writes and says, you know, women sh- should be able to do this. Why not? There should be, you know, equal inability to men. But he's writing this at a time when the idea of a queen regnant for England is so far in the future. When push comes to shove, we don't know what he would have thought yeah. in 1553. It's this really complicated idea of gender and sex and female identity that begins to create these ideas that surround Lady Jane Grey and Mary and Elizabeth. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting, isn't it? Because it's su- such an ingrained thing that obviously we can't look at this time period without taking that into consideration and how that worked at the time. It's it's really interesting. And when you were saying about the rib and the, the idea of women being pure and, and needing to maintain that, it's so obvious why a woman's reputation was, of course, so important and crucial, especially for our queens and, and queen's consort as well. Absolutely. It's it's this idea that. I mean, in the Victorian age, we have it as this angel in the home that, you know, they need to be kept separate and be kept kind of holy. And you think, you know, like women at the time are still going out. They're still doing things. You know, women are still running businesses. Women are still acting as their own people. But somehow that hasn't kind of filtered up to the main thought of the, of the era. Yes, and, and, and interesting how you're saying, obviously, they're seen as inferior and, you know, inferior in every way, really, intellectually, spiritually, morally. <laughs> it's, there was a lot up against them, wasn't there? Absolutely. It's it's one of those times where I would love to go back and see yeah. what life was like. But I also think I would not want to go as a woman and as a non-royal woman that just... Mm-mm. Yeah, that <laughs> does be, not seem like a good time. <laughs> that would be extremely challenging. You're absolutely right. Now we mentioned those two those two texts earlier, so let's talk about them a little bit more. Perhaps there are some people listening that haven't heard of them. So could you tell us a little bit about what they are, what they're about, and what did the authors hope would kind of come out of this? Yeah. So John Knox's work is, as we've said, the first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women, which is is pretty self explanatory. If if you're hoping for nuance in that, there is there is not much. He is very, very anti-female power. He's very much against female rule. And so what really colors that is he has been writing this work during Mary's reign. And so he has left Scotland and England, and he is on the continent. So he's writing this from an outside view. And when he looks at, you know, the the British Isles, he sees Marie de Guise acting as regent in Scotland, who is Catholic. He sees Mary I as Queen Regnant in England, also Catholic. And he sees in France, Mary Queen of Scots and the Dauphin, both Catholic, and both being raised kind of in a sense for power. And so he is writing this very much as an attack on Catholic rule. And what's really important for Knox when we look at this work is that he is a reformer. And so he is against Catholicism in all sorts of different ways. And so having female Catholic rule is another one of these things that he just sees is against what he believes. And so this whole work is looking at the religious, the historical, kind of the the philosophical reasons in his eyes why women can't be rulers. And then on the flip side, we have Howard, who in his lawful defense of the or dutiful defense of lawful regiment of women. There's so many long titles. <laughs> um, he is a Catholic aristocrat, and he is writing during the reign of Elizabeth I. And so what particularly is intriguing is we have this Catholic aristocrat who is unafraid to say that he is you know, Catholic during this Protestant reign. And he writes really favorably about Elizabeth. And throughout the work, he responds to Knox and to other reformers who have written against female rule. And 
he basically argues that, you know, what's what's wrong with having a woman in power? Presumably, if they're raised in the same way as men, if they're educated the same, if they understand this role, you know, why can't they be in power? I think part of what he's hoping to achieve in a very different way from Knox is he is hoping to save his own skin. So Knox writes as uh, as someone who adamantly wants to take down Catholic female monarchy and then accidentally leaves it too long and publishes it as Elizabeth is coming to the throne. But Howard has this entire family history of treason. He is not starting from a good spot. He already has kind of three strikes against him. He's living on borrowed time. And so he's writing this as a desperate attempt to keep Elizabeth kind of on his side and to keep him on Elizabeth's good side. So he writes this from essentially house arrest. He writes this from a very tenuous spot. And so this is kind of a plea to have mercy on him, let him go. He's not a threat. Catholics aren't a threat. And so that's that's how he comes at this work. That's really interesting. And and in terms of, we've talked about this a little bit, but can you tell us a little bit more about how Knox and Howard understood precedence of female rule? Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> so I guess we'll start, I'll start with Knox because he's chronologically first, um, but then end with Howard because it's kind of a happier note. Um, so there are three different parts to their understandings of female rule. And so the first is this religious aspect. So what's interesting when Henry VIII, Edward VI, and Elizabeth I are on the throne is that the head of the church is also the head of state. When we have Mary on the throne, she separates those. And so it's really important to understand that context that Knox is writing when Protestant female rule is the head of the church. And so in this religious aspect, Knox particularly argues against female rule because of this this combined role. And he looks to the Bible, two verses in the book of Timothy, which say that women aren't allowed to speak or teach in the congregation. He's looking at the church in England and going, a woman can't be the head of that because the Bible says, you know, if they can't speak in a parish church, in a congregation, how are they going to lead a national church? Layered on this is the idea that only the clergy, so only ordained people, should be in roles of leadership. And so if a lay man can't even be part of leadership of the church, how on earth can a woman who is a lay woman take on that role? And so his understanding of female rule is essentially taken from this very biblical context. And Howard takes this in a very different way and looks at different examples and says that, you know, God takes precedence in everything. And so a wife can, can disobey her husband if she's following what she believes God is telling her to do. So if her husband decides to go off and do something morally wrong, she can challenge him on that because she's following her morality. There's also this idea that Howard has that when in Genesis, God gives dominion to what's often just seen as to Adam, Howard says, hold on a second, that verb is in the plural. God is giving it to them. And so says, you know, Adam's not the only one who's being given this kind of, in a sense, political role. That's also been given to Eve. And so these are the religious ideas behind that. They also both turn to what they call natural precedents, which are basically ideas built on gendered roles, understandings of gender. And so Knox in that argues that women shouldn't rule because they're more impulsive. And so, you know, how can someone be in charge of a realm if they're impulsive? Because he sees men as being more rational, that's the natural choice. But in turn, when Knox sees this as, you know, men are just built for leadership. Howard challenges that a little and adds some nuance and goes, yes, but, and he looks at, you know, male siblings and goes, you know, the oldest isn't always chosen. And presumably the oldest would be the one with most experience, would be the one, you know, who's 
literally born to the role. And so he looks at biblical examples where younger siblings are called to leadership. So we think of the moment when Cain murders Abel because Abel was chosen. Abel is the younger child. And so Howard really focuses focuses on this idea that just because you might not be born to the role or you might not have the perfect qualifications, you can still have power and you can still really hold that political role. And I think one of the best parts of Howard's work is he looks at bees and ants, as in the animals, and goes, they're tiny, but they have highly structured organizations within each of their groups. And so, you know, if, if bees and ants can be tiny and have, you know, highly evolved societies, why can't women? And he goes, basically, you know, if they can organize themselves, if they're tiny and can do this, clearly physical stature is not important. And he goes, basically, that if, if they can do this, the human equivalent would be women doing this, which I just think is a fantastic parallel. <laughs> I wonder what, so, um, what Elizabeth thought of that when she <laughs> read that. Right. Right. There's also, I think what's really intriguing with that as well is there's this idea in the early modern world, they're beginning to look at bees as being ruled by a queen. And so we have this understanding that's starting to emerge that, you know, in the natural world, the females seem to be in charge of a lot. And so if they can do that, why can't people? And I think that just leaves kind of the last little part, which is experience. So both Knox and Howard look at precedence of female rule by looking at previous examples and looking at how women have previously held leadership roles. And I think what's particularly interesting in this is that whereas Knox looks on a very broad level, Howard goes deeper and goes, you know, we should look at this as individuals. He looks at it as kind of this this individual basis that particular women could be rulers. And he doesn't dismiss women simply because they're women. He doesn't dismiss them simply because of these gender roles. He goes, you know, hang on, maybe they don't have the terms at the time, but maybe the equivalent of a working class woman shouldn't have power. But why can't a royal woman have power? And so it's this idea that somehow class negates gender and sex. Everything in Knox and Howard's works are deeply influenced by these religious, natural, and then the experience that they see women having. So I guess that's a long answer to these are the precedents. Yeah, no, that was really good. And I was just thinking out of curiosity, you you mentioned that John Knox was obviously writing during Mary's reign, the, the text that we talked about earlier, and that it was more a sort of attack on Catholic female rulers. Did he specifically write anything about Elizabeth? Yeah, so he really singles out what he calls the mischievous Marys, which I love as a term. That's a good so title, really, isn't it? The mischievous Mary. Right? <laughs> he's really singling out Marie de Guise, Mary Queen of Scots, and Mary the First. But what happens is he has this unfortunate, unfortunate publication moment when everything gets delayed just enough that it goes to print too late. And he's written this against Catholic monarchy, but doesn't think he has to specify that because it'll be printed and they'll all still be queens. But it goes to print and Elizabeth comes to the throne and that happens about within six months of each other. And so all of a sudden, Knox is probably sitting there going, I should have specified, I should have said something, now what? And so he doesn't explicitly attack Elizabeth, but I think what's really telling is he doesn't apologize for it either. So he, once Mary the first in England has died, he decides to come back. And he asks Elizabeth I for safe passage through England. And I guess that's a little risky because he, as I say, has not apologized to her for essentially writing that women don't have a right to the throne. And she takes this very personally. And she says, you know, no, you you can't come through England to get to Scotland. Find a different way. Despite the fact that he hasn't singled her out, 
she sees it very much as an attack on her as a queen, which I think is interesting because there is this disconnect between what Knox meant and how he was read, which is always an issue in historical sources. But I think that's just the perfect moment where he never calls out Elizabeth specifically, but she takes it as, you know, a, a personal political affront, which is fair enough given Knox's wording. Yeah. And in regards to, to Howard, do you think he was genuine in his beliefs or do you think it was quite heavily motivated by, by wanting Elizabeth's forgiveness? I think, I think it's a bit of both. I think there is a, a massive argument to be made that a lot of it is he doesn't want to get executed. He doesn't, he doesn't want to die in prison. But I think another aspect of it is the way that his Catholicism affects his beliefs. And in a sense, how he sees it is that because in Catholicism, the Pope is the head of the church, there's no way because the Pope can't be a woman. There's no way for a woman to have spiritual authority. And so in his eyes, Elizabeth I isn't the head of the church because, you know, the Church of England isn't the real church. And so he can accept Elizabeth without accepting her spiritual authority, which is one of the big sticking points. I think partly his Catholicism and his idea that Elizabeth isn't the head of the church plays into why he can accept female monarchs. But I think also he's he's looking at this family history and going, you know, his his grandfather barely got off. Yes, um, very lucky escape. <laughs> yes, yes. It's it's always good to live, you know, just long enough for the king to die before he executes you. His father, who's kind of the more famous Henry Howard, the Earl of Surrey, is not so lucky. Howard has cousins who were in the tower. Howard spent a little bit of time in prison in London. So he he knows what it means to go against the authority figures. And so I think part of it is this attempt to stay on Elizabeth's good side. And part of it is this genuine belief that she has no, as a woman, has no threat to his spiritual beliefs. Okay, so let's dive into the nitty gritty. How did, again, you have touched on this, but let's go a little bit deeper. How did Knox and Howard differ in their interpretation of queenship? So the biggest difference, I think, is this religious aspect. Because Knox is a reformer, he is, he probably wouldn't call himself this, but he is what we would now term Protestant. So he sees the Church of England as being, you know, the the true church. And his understanding of that then is that the monarch is the head of the church, whether that's a king or a queen. In his idea, the political power is also the spiritual authority. And so when those are combined, that becomes a threat to Knox because he believes that women can't hold this role. He believes that women cannot be at the head of the church. And so his attack on queenship, in a sense, has to be taken in that religious vein, that he is not only attacking the woman in power because, you know, he thinks that she is weak and impotent and foolish and mad and frenetic in his words. He also sees that as spiritual threat. And so he writes against queenship because of this combined role. Then Howard, on the other hand, and we've touched on this slightly, is this idea that because spiritual authority and political authority are separate, it doesn't matter if there's a queen. It doesn't matter if there's a king. It doesn't matter if, you know, it's, it's a six-day-old child. It's all the same. And so this idea that a queen has no inherent risk because she's not the head of the church. And so this understanding of queenship as being purely political really affects both of their works. The one, as a Protestant, can attack Catholic and Protestant queenship because of this religious aspect, whereas a Catholic can support a Protestant monarch, which seems just absolutely (laughs) insane given the political and religious tensions. He can support Elizabeth because... He doesn't see her as a threat 
to his faith, which I think is the biggest difference in how they are both approaching queenship. On the surface, it sounds a little bit odd, but then it makes perfect sense, doesn't it, that he just is not feeling as threatened as Knox was feeling about um, yeah. the, the Queen. So, so interesting. And was their work, I'm just wondering, was their work widely published? Was it popular? Was it widely read? Do we have any information about that? What's really interesting in comparing these sources is that Knox's was printed. It was a printed work. It was designed to be distributed it would be out there for everyone to read. Because there are so many responses to Knox, I think it's it's fair to say that it was a widely read work. Or if people hadn't read it, they knew the main points of argument. Howard's work, on the other hand, was a lot more personal. So he started this work potentially because Cecil asked him to. We don't know for sure, but it's potentially because there's this attempt, not only on Howard's part, to clear his name, but there's also this attempt to show that Catholics can be loyal to a Protestant queen. And so he writes this as a very personal work and writes this and presents it as a gift to Elizabeth in 1590. We don't know if she actually read it. We don't know if you know, she ever saw it, but he kind of presented it to the court for her. What's particularly interesting in that is that each copy that Howard makes of his work is dedicated to a specific person. So whereas Knox's work is, you know, printed by rote, Howard is what's called kind of in academia, a scribal publication. So it's, it's written for a very select audience. And so regardless of the fact that there are only a handful of copies, the people who had this would have read it, would have talked about it. So the ideas would have spread beyond the people who actually owned copies. And what's interesting in that is we see as well the difference between Knox and Howard as people, because Knox publishes this very popular way by putting it in type. And Howard kind of goes back to his aristocratic roots and goes, I don't want to print my work because then the stationer, in a sense, the printer has a copyright and he wants to keep that work for himself. And so he decides to do it as all handwritten works. There's also, in a sense, this Catholic aspect that if you're a Catholic, you don't want to publicly out yourself in England in the 1570s, 80s, 90s. And so you don't really want to go to a printer because then the Protestant majority is going to see you. And so there's this idea that if he does it by a scribe, it's more personal, but it also kind of contains him and contains him from this Protestant majority who probably won't like him. Howard probably does this to limit the distribution and the exposure. But as I say, each copy has a different front page that has a different beautifully illustrated coat of arms for the person he's presenting it to. Kind of every single copy, we know exactly who it went to. We know that at some point, this person probably held it and read it. Whereas Knox's opinions and his writing was spread way more popularly, Howard's was probably only really looked at at court because the people that he is dedicating his works to are all you know, nobility. And so there's this very different divide between how they're writing, why they're writing, and then how their sources are being read, which is really interesting. Yeah. And do many copies of Howard's um, manuscript survive? I had at one point the exact numbers, (laughs) but I think you can probably count on two hands the number of copies we have left. So there are, there were very few copies made to begin with. We have some partial copies which is interesting for looking at how his ideas progressed as he was writing. But we only have, you know, a really small handful of finished, dedicated, written out works. Okay. And I was going to ask you whether we know how Elizabeth reacted or what she thought about these works. But of course, you mentioned that we don't know that Elizabeth actually ever read 
Henry Howard's work, but do we know, uh, uh, well, she didn't want John Knox to come through England, so that's a good clue about what she thought yeah. about him. <laughs> but do you want to make any other comments about Elizabeth's kind of reaction to these ideas? Yeah, so I think the biggest point with, with Knox is Elizabeth does take this as a, a political threat to herself. And she really takes this, in a sense, personally and professionally, because she is both. She takes this as a direct threat to her as a queen. And so she obviously does not take that well. And so Knox never really gets what he thinks is due to him as a reformer. I think we see Elizabeth reacting in very negatively to Knox's work. And I think she responds more positively to Howard. We have less of an indication of precisely how she reacted. We don't have, you know, the equivalent. She she never calls Howard to court. It's like, yes, you're my favorite person now. So we don't have that opposite when she refuses Knox access. She doesn't explicitly give Howard access, but he lives. He outlives Elizabeth, which I think is possibly one of the biggest indications that Elizabeth is not upset, especially because he has dedicated this work to her and she would have been made aware If, you know, if Knox had dedicated this work to her, she would have gone, "Mm -mm, take my name off of that. I do not want that associated with me. And so the fact that Howard survives, the fact that he then gains prominence in James the sixth and first court, I think says a lot about how Elizabeth reacts to it in that she simultaneously says a lot by not saying a lot. Yes, and I agree. The fact that he lived is a, is a big sign, I think, that she obviously didn't feel threatened by him like she must have felt by, by Knox's work. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. I feel like I always learn so much about aspects of Tudor history that I don't often often study too, too closely. So thank you. But I wanted to ask you, Johanna, what's next for you? What are you doing after you say you're coming to the end of this, this journey that you're on? So what's happening next? It's kind of all up in the air right now. So I'm in the last six months to a year, kind of depends how timing and stuff works of PhD. So it's almost finished. So I've got an eye on doing some postdoctoral work. I have an eye on potentially going into lecturing, whatever jobs are out there. (laughs) So kind of those are the two next avenues, but I am really looking at publishing my master's work. And so looking at of how to do that and how to make this you know, more widely available yeah. for you know the, the tutor community and for historians because I think it is something that has been overlooked. So I guess next step is hopefully being gainfully gainfully employed <laughs> and then getting getting my name hopefully on the front of some books. Well, I hope so. And I look forward to that. So keep us updated on on the journey. And just before I let you go, a last thing, a Tudor takeaway for our listeners. So something for them to go off and explore after the episode. Yes. So I have the, I guess it was very exciting in hindsight. It was not exciting when I found this out at the time that I had done my entire master's on a copy of Howard's work that was in the British Library. And being in Canada, I could not really justify, at the time, could not justify an expensive trip over for a source that may or may not have been useful. So I asked them, you know, could they make copies of it, which is a service they do. So I had a copy, which was very exciting. And then I went a few months ago to look on the British Library site for something else and accidentally stumbled across all of the digitization of Howard's work, which had not been there when I had asked for copies. (laughs) So it's always frustrating. But I guess that's that's the takeaway is if you would like to go to the British Library site, I will give you a full URL. Yes. yes. Um, But you can go and you can flip through this work and you can see kind of the handwriting changes. You can see the the fact that it It is this personal source. It is handwritten. And if you can flip through it and see it and engage with it, which I think is so exciting, especially in a COVID pandemic world, wherever you are, you do not have to be at the British Library in order to enjoy this work. That's fantastic. I absolutely love learning about new digitized manuscripts. I keep a list. I have to say, I keep a list on my desktop. And whenever I come across a new, you know, I try and keep them in 
some sort of categories, but it's a bit messy. So thank you. I'm adding that one. And yes, I'll add the link for our listeners to the show notes so that they can have a little look. And it's, it's great how you can zoom in and look at all the little the little details. I love it. Yes. Yes. It's so good. And I think it's it's one thing to look at it on the screen. And I think what shocked me when I finally got to the British Library, I thought, I don't need this source anymore because I'm, I'm working on something new, but I want to get it out because I've never seen it in person. And so it's, it's always amazing to see how, you know, the laptop screen changes the work and how, when you hold it, it just has this different feel, which is so exciting, but yeah, it's, it's amazing to have all of the digital sources. I love it. So great. I know me too. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to you with us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.